Okay, thank you for checking out Museum Ship Mafia, where we take you behind the scenes of museum ships across the country and around the world. My name is Ken Stano with the YouTube channel History X, and tonight it's going to be another live crossover broadcast with History X, the USS Slater, and the Buffalo Naval Park. Uh, tonight's episode, let's see, we are going to be talking about, let's see, there we go, we're going to be talking about the Cass and Young, a Fletcher class destroyer that is only one of four Fletcher class destroyers remaining, and it's on display in Boston, Massachusetts. We're going to have Buzz Smith on in about 20 minutes to talk about uh, everything they got going on there. And let's see. Well, we don't have Shane, but we definitely we got John. So we're going to add John up from the USS Slater onto the mix. So, John, y'all checked in, ready to go? I am ready to go. Are you ready to go? Yeah, I am. But you know what? Uh, Shane from the Buffalo Naval Park is not with <laughs> us. And yeah. <laughs> and I don't know if you heard my phone ringing in the background, but that was Shane. Okay. Yeah. So, do we need I to call him live on air? And do a whole IT. Um, <laughs> No, <laughs> no, I'm not. Um, you know, he's calling me now. Is he really? <sighs> All right. Yeah. You know what? Put him on speaker. What the hell? Okay. Let's see if we get. Let's see if we can talk him through this. This is going to be the worst podcast ever. Um, and while you, <sighs> John, hello. How are you? <laughs> I'm, no. I'm well. How are you? I, I cannot get into the the broadcast. I'm shocked at what I'm hearing. <laughs> Ken says he's shocked. Uh huh. No, like I'm clicking the link that he sent last week, and it just goes to uh, you know, it just goes to broadcasts, and it's like you have no upcoming broadcasts. So at the top in in Streamyard, make sure you're under the History X drop down uh, menu. And this whole time, Buzz is uh, uh, Buzz from the Cats and Youngs in the background. I don't I know what happened here. I'm in my account, the Shane at Buffalo Naval Park account. I'm just wondering if something happened to my computer and like it's not connected to you. Uh, so top left, there's a drop down. It says my team, History X, whatever. Make no, sure it says History X. I don't see that in the top left. I see broadcasts and videos, destinations, and members. What do you think, Ken? Oh, I got nothing. I, oh. uh, I'm, I'm looking at the com. I, I, <laughs> okay. I'm looking at uh, Lego History Sam's uh, question here about it the cast and young. We'll get to that. Um, uh, tell you what, Shane. I will send you the invite again to your email. So it's going to get to you in a few seconds. Okay. Yeah, sounds great. All right. Thank yeah. you. And You're in, welcome. In the meantime, th thanks for running our IT support, John. I appreciate that. <laughs> you know, I uh, spent all day at the ship doing IT today. Oh, did you really? I did. We moved some offices onto the ship. Oh, okay. When we when we can talk about that. Well, um, so like I was saying a little bit ago, uh, we're going to bring uh, Buzz on uh, for the Cass and Young. I'm pretty uh, interested in hearing about this tonight, not only uh, because the Cass and Young is a Fletcher class destroyer. Obviously, we've talked about the Sullivans um, quite a bit here on Museum Ship Mafia, but to have the perspective of another Fletcher class destroyer on here, of course, we've had Park Stevenson from the USS Kid on as well. So it'll be pretty cool to hear what Buzz has to say. Um, let's see. And before we get too deep into things, I want to remind everybody that Museum Ship Mafia is made possible in part by Audible audiobooks. If you guys have a long drive or you have trouble sleeping and you want to fall asleep to an audiobook, check out the link in the description below for this broadcast. There's a special offer for you guys, and we appreciate the support that you give us in turn. Uh, Audible will recognize that and throw it back our way. So that's always pretty cool. And another thing I wanted to mention is recently I became a member of the Facebook group Museum Ships. Now, I was not aware of this Facebook group until, uh, looks like, John, should I bring Shane? No, 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 we're going to make him pay for a little bit. 
Um, so I was not aware of this Facebook group, but Connor, who was our guest here on Museum Ship Mafia last month, Connor Kilgore, who uh, is a volunteer with the Alexander Henry Icebreaker. Let me. So he gave me this mug. We met in person on Sunday. Can you guys see that? We can. It's just a little bit of a glare, but you can see it. Oh, that's okay. But you can see it, right? See my mug? Isn't that cool? So anyway, John, you're not seeing the humor of that. So <laughs> um, Connor wanted to visit the Pearl Harbor gun, which is on display permanent display here in Minneapolis. For those of you that aren't aware, the U.S. was actually the ones to fire the first shots of Pearl Harbor, not the Japanese. And it was the gun from the USS Ward that sunk one of the Japanese mini subs trying to get into the harbor. Connor wanted to check that out. And so he was in town and I got the chance to say hi. There's a picture of the gun right there. So it was really great to meet him. He gave me this fantastic mug. So I, I not only wanted to give a shout out to um, Connor, but also the Museum Ships Facebook group. If any of you are watching us tonight and you heard about the Museum Ship Mafia through the uh, Museum Ships Facebook group, throw a comment uh, here. Let us know. And damn it, I was just going to bring Shane on and now he disappeared. You know what? <laughs> oh wait, here we go. All right, were you uh, were you getting annoyed? Who? You? No, sir. No, I don't know what's going on with Streamyard. I think uh, th this from our twenty hundred watch that we had. Again, I I am not able to see comments, or I'm not able to comment. So I think we need a total refresh of the StreamYard thing. Because well, here, hold on a second here. Let's see. Um, can you see? Okay, so here's Michael Phil. It's Michael, Michael, thanks for checking in with us tonight. We're always glad to have you on there. Can you see his comment there? I, I can, and I can see it on the side. But I remember when we were doing this before, there's a little text box on the bottom where we would be able to comment yes. on other people. That has been gone for okay. the 20 hundred watch and for now it's like we're not actually in the buffalo naval parks thing or something i, I don't know so i steven and i are gonna have to sit down i apologize uh to you guys especially but then to everyone uh you know eric and michael and cc and lego history sam hi uh so i just wanted to apologize i'm sorry for the delay um it's don't, fine. For don't forget eric um, eric man what's going on with these sabers man i don't know i don't know <laughs> Don't forget Frank. Um, Hello, Frank. <laughs> yep, Texu. Yeah. You got it. Yeah. So, and like That's I was saying, it's uh, it's really cool to have anyone tuning in from uh, the Museum Ships Facebook group. Uh, we're happy to have you on board and yeah. looking forward to doing some more stuff. So it's a real interactive group, a uh, really interesting group, and uh, looking forward to learning more about it. Uh, let's see. All right. So. Um, hey, nice sweatshirt, by the way. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So and I've, your got, ugly. I've got my Sullivan's sweatshirt on. I've got my Alexander Henry mug. Can you see the mug? Yes. Okay. All it right. is. That's a lovely mug, actually. That's really nice. Yeah. Yeah. So you probably missed the part. Connor, who is an admin, an administrator for the Museum Ships Facebook group. Yep. Uh, we had the chance to meet on Sunday. So that was pretty cool. Uh, cool. Let's see. So, John, what's going on with the Slater? <clears throat> Uh, let's see. We got less than a month until we open for our 26th season, April 5th. So uh, <laughs> next week, we may possibly be turning the water back on the ship. Uh, Ooh, we took the week. bubblers out of the river t uh, Monday. Uh, we actually barely used them all winter. The river mm. iced up once or twice, and it was mm. barely. Uh, let's see. What else? Our new shoreside building was scheduled to begin installation at the end of March. It's been pushed back a little bit, so we're hoping uh, sometime in mid to late April. Uh, so our offices have now been moved from the shore to our officer's wardroom. Um, hmm. We did all that work today. Is that what that post was that you guys had on the Facebook channel? Uh, I think it was yeah. Shanna and somebody else 
and yep. that was Shannon and Joanne. Okay, and that's in the wardroom. Yeah, so they're the ones that use the offices on shore. Uh, okay. So they're the ones that we had to move. That means for the first month or so of our tour season, our tours are not going to be able to come through officers' country or into the officers' wardroom. Uh, so we're we're th- trying to find a creative way to explain all that stuff without actually going in there. But we also feel bad. People are buying a ticket to see the ship. So we may um, do like a reduced ticket price for the first month. We might give out, um, you know, come back at a future date for free type thing. We we did that in the past, actually. Um, so we're thinking of things. Well, and yeah, I mean, this is like, this is like typical stuff that any kind of museum ship has to work out when you've got, you know, transitions like this or when you have repairs yeah. that need to be made. And yep. uh, nobody knows that more than than Shane. Um, John Epp, curator at the USS Slater in Albany, New York. If you guys want to know what I was just referencing, check out their Facebook page. Uh, look up the USS Slater and you'll you'll see all their posts, uh, especially the one that I was referencing today. Um, you can also search for the USS Slater on YouTube. Get on YouTube, simply type in USS Slater, and they continue to... I love how their desk doubles as the opera. <laughs> they So they continue to grow. Um, and you can also find the USS Slater at www.ussslater.org. Um, anything else you wanted to throw in from the Slater? Uh... I'll throw it out there since we we announced it in our uh, February newsletter that just went out last week. Uh, So the Destroyer Escort Sales Association, uh, DESA, they're the ones who are actually responsible for getting the ship. Um, They began looking for Destroyer Escort in the late 80s um, and then eventually came across Slater, Itos, in Greece in the early 90s. They are closing up shop. Uh, They they were going to close down in 2020, but then COVID happened. So this year they're coming up to the ship in June um, to celebrate DE Day, and then you know we'll have a full like banquet and and things like that. Um, so they're closing down. Uh, we'll gain their membership. It's uh, it's a last man standing um, association with all the World War II vets now passing on. They've decided to to shut things down. So we'll be uh, incorporating them into the Destroyer Squares um, Historical Museum at the Slater. Mm, wow. So if anyone is interested in coming out in June, uh, it's going to be a weekend event. Uh, you can reach out to us on Facebook, email, uh, whatever. So John, um, so John, are you actually saying the DESA organization is folding and then you guys will kind of be taking, not taking over management per se, but maybe taking over some administrative jobs of <clears throat> duties of this organization or uh they are yeah they're shutting they're shutting down completely and their uh their treasury what's the balance of the treasury has been um transferred to us to gotcha. the museum okay. and um any of their membership lists you know we get that we'll add it to our membership list but effectively dessa will be will be gone can't wow. think of a better spot for it to go uh, Ken, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, on board the Little Rock, we have a DESA display. Uh, it would be great to have you come up here at some point in our, you know, and maybe have you look through it and maybe see if there's things that we can deaccession out of our collection from the DESA organization uh, and then give it to its rightful spot uh, with your memorial ship. Yeah, I remember uh, you mentioning uh, something about that a while back. And, yeah, well, if you want, we can talk and, and maybe yeah. send you some photos of what what the displays look like. Again, yeah, it probably was put together 1987, I believe. So yep. it's been almost 40 years, and uh, it would be right uh, to maybe deaccession the materials we have uh, for DEs specifically, and then get them into your hands where the collection should reside potentially. Yeah, that would be great. So is that something that's like public knowledge or is that something that was just announced or? Uh, well, they announced it in 2020. They were going to hold their final reunion here in Albany in September of 2020. But, you know, okay. COVID happened. And okay. then um, they just haven't been able to do it the past few years. And COVID's finally died down and uh, they've decided let's do it. 
2023. COVID. Yeah, COVID screws up everything. Yeah. Um, we will have some, you know, the World War II DE vets. A few of them will come out and uh, and visit. Uh, otherwise, it'll probably be some of the post-war DE vets. So the Knox class frigates, those were the last DEs into the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, we're, we're hoping for a big turnout. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, speaking of screwing up everything, uh, Shane, <laughs> what's the latest and greatest at... The uh, <laughs> Buffalo Naval Park. Sure, look at that. Yeah, mm -hmm. it. Uh, it. Yeah, I like that shot. Thank you, Ken. Um, do you guys? Uh, do you guys have any snow on the ground yet? I know John was saying in Albany, no snow. He barely had. They barely had to use the bubblers in the river. What's your guys' situation right now? Yeah, we. Well, it's been it's been cold, but it's been sunny for about four days in a row now. So all the snow is gone. Our Got bubblers it. are still running, uh, but yeah, this mile this winter has been very mild, other than those three major storms that we've had here in Western New York. Mm -hmm. uh, other than that, there's been no snow on the ground. And if people remember when I'm do doing that that video with the tape measure and the river and stuff, that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, snow used to be on the ground for weeks and weeks and weeks here in Buffalo. Now it's here for three or four or five days drops a lot three or four or five days then it's gone and it just doesn't have it just runs off it doesn't have that time to soak into the ground and get into the uh you know the water table or or whatever those other terms are that i i'm not a weatherman so i don't know but you know so that's where maybe where the river drops because it's just not being fed from as much water uh you know, um, as, but yeah, we still have the bubblers going, uh, you know, the Buffalo Naval Park, we are a swirl of activity all the time. So we have a party coming up on the 16th, March 16th. We are doing a St. Patrick's Day party uh, on the Sullivan's. Uh, Information is on our website. If you'd like to attend, we're going to have corned beef and cabbage. And uh, hmm. there'll be about seven stations that will be open on the ship. Uh, that people will walk around and there'll be a, a guide or a docent there to talk about that particular space. Uh, we open March 25th, and then we are beginning the celebration, which will kind of loop into our conversation today, beginning the celebration on April 4 of the 80th birthday for the Sullivans, and then incorporating other Fletcher classes, Cass and Young and Kid, potentially the Velos, uh, for birthday celebrations throughout the year. So we're going to have a long birthday, uh, a lot of events throughout the summer that are uh, Sullivan-centric uh, to honor the 80th anniversary of her commissioning. So, God, so you, guys, you guys get busy. It sounds like even though it's not the official open, you use uh, St. Patrick's Day as kind of like a pre-open. Pre-open, open. Yeah, pre-open, open. Got it. Are you going to be doing that ceremony on the Sullivans, um, Shoreside, Little Rock? It will be. John, being in Buffalo, it is weather dependent. Yeah. Uh, certainly, <laughs> the ship will be open. I, I think we're going to have a. We're going to have a. We work a lot with the Sullivans Brewery, based out of Ireland. Um, mm -hmm. If you guys have heard of that beer, and uh, so I think. There'll be a blending. Certainly the ships will be open, but I think the food, and then we're going to have some short presentations of 10 minutes each. I'll be giving one on the history of the family and the ship, and then Bill Abbott will be uh, talking about what we're doing and where we're going with the ship and what are the most recent updates with her uh, preservation and stabilization projects. So. Cool. For for those of you that are viewing right now, and right now we've got a little shy of 40 people checking us out. This is Shane oh, Stevenson, hi, curator of the Buffalo and Erie County Naval and Military Park. To check out their YouTube channel, search for Buffalo Naval Park in the search bar. Of course, if you want to support the Buffalo and Erie County Naval and Military Park, simply check out their website, buffalonavalpark.org. Uh, what else you got going on there? Uh, I think... Um... You know, we're doing a lot of work on the ships. We're going to be opening up uh, the three inch 50 ready service locker that hasn't been opened up before. So we're getting that stabilized and some lighting in there. Uh, we're going to, I'm doing some add on tours this year. So I'm doing an add on tour uh, that's a gun tour 
five inch, six inch torpedo tubes. That will be an hour long. And that's add on to the ticket uh, that someone would buy. And then that's an extra hour tour that they get. And then I'm also doing weapons control, which is uh, the main control for the Talos missile system. And that will be a uh, add on uh, for the Little Rock. So throughout the season, I'm going to be doing on Thursdays and Fridays, every other Thursday and Friday, these extra add-on tours that someone can buy a ticket to the normal tour. And then at, say, 1.30, then they would meet with me, and then we have that extra behind-the-scenes tour. And then in addition to the curator tours and things like that. So I think I have 48 or 52 tours scheduled this summer and into the fall uh, for, for, ex yeah, for extra uh, for people to get behind the scenes and things like that and to learn a little bit extra about uh, the, our, our vessels under our care and their stories. Have and then also I have that book coming out, you know, so I have what? that uh, I have yeah. that Arcadia book coming out, the Images of America series. Oh, uh, I've been working okay. on that feverishly for the past three days because the edits are due. So that book about the Buffalo Naval Park, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's Arcadia series, Images of America, every city has them. You know, they all have the same sepia cover with a historical photo on it. I'm sure you've seen them. They even sell them at Walgreens and things like that. Uh, so I did one on the Buffalo Naval Park, and that will be coming out May 15th. And then we're going to have a book release party on May 23rd, uh, you know, to invite people to uh, meet me and devalue their book by having me sign it, <laughs> as I always like to say. Um, John Epp, do you think there's any chance i know there's power going to it but do you think there's any chance that shane actually has his microphone plugged in it looks like it is i know but do you not hear me no i can i can hear you it just sounds fine. fun it, it sounds it well sounds you were like just that. trashing shane today jeez yeah, oh, he he's, was, he gets frustrated, and I understand, Ken. I under like, hey, everybody, I don't even see that we have forty people. I don't know. Again, we're, the interface that I'm used to, I have not seen on Stringer. The, the, I can't make a comment. I don't see how many people are watching us. I don't have our three logos in the corner anymore, like I used to. So I don't know what's going on here. But uh, well, I can well, understand Ken's frustration. And I'm sorry well, about that. I, We'll get you fixed up. We'll get you fixed up. So for those of you that are new to Museum Ship Mafia tonight, I always say one of the simplest yet most effective ways to support museum ships like the USS Slater or the Buffalo Naval Park with the USS Croker, the Little Rock, the, the Sullivans, or the Cass and Young, like what we've got um, coming up with Buzz in a few moments. One of the simplest yet most effective ways to support these guys is to simply check out their YouTube channels, check out their Facebook pages, uh, click subscribe on YouTube, follow their Facebook group. It just throws a huge amount of support their way. The Slater and the Buffalo Naval Park, they're both over a thousand subscribers. So anytime you click subscribe, it helps to get advertising dollars thrown back their way. Uh, I also want to say for audio versions of this podcast, simply search for Museum Ship Mafia on your favorite podcast platform. We definitely cannot do this without subscribers and viewers. So we appreciate your support. Submit your comments and questions. Let us know where you're from, which uh, YouTube channel you're watching watching us on. Whether it was whether it's History X, the Slater's YouTube channel, the Buffalo Naval Park's YouTube channel. You know, let us know where you're checking in from. Um, Can I answer this question? For yeah, go for it. This is so from Lego History Sam. I like. I always yeah, like. Him. Yeah, he's a great guy. We met when we were in Waterloo. Oh, so no he kidding. works. Yeah, and he's he's a. Uh, well, I, I, he's watching. So, I mean, he's a, a young kid that has a passion and he makes Lego models of various museum ships. And it's he's doing a real good job. I mean, they're fabulous stuff. You could probably check him out. And his Instagram page, he's very proud of that. And he should be. So did the USS, did the USS the Sullivans have a uh, behind her F-funnel torpedo and three launchers? Well, we did have what were uh, quintuple tubes. All right. So we had uh, two sets of five torpedo tubes in a rotating mount on the 01 level. Uh, the first one was taken out at the end of World War II. That would have been the quintuple torpedo tube uh, Mark 15 uh, at the end of World War II. Then at some point in the 1950s, uh, they removed, probably 1959, they removed the second quintuple which was aft of the aft stack in between 
that and the aft deck house. Uh, and that was probably removed in 58 or 59. Uh, we still have the mount that you can see the rotating mount. But uh, so when we got the Sullivans, uh, we did not have either quintuple. And then they added the Mark 32 triple torpedo, which is maybe what you're talking about. Uh, that was more anti uh, ASW, anti submarine warfare uh, in during the Cold War. So now we have the two triples Mark 32 torpedo tubes on either side near our Bofors, uh, you know, near the tubs uh, where our Bofors are. So, yeah, unfortunately, this picture is a little too small to even show. Yeah. 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 It, it was worth a try. But if yeah. you see the uh, where our awning is, that white awning with the little yeah. green dot with the shamrock, that's yeah. where that second mount would have been right above where that awning is, where people walk on for the first time. That's where uh, that rounded mount is for the quintuple. All right. Who's ready to talk about the Cass and Young? I am. <laughs> All right. So uh, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to introduce um, Warren Buzz Smith. <laughs> he likes to go by Buzz. And Buzz is going to tell us about the USS Cass and Young tonight, another Fletcher class destroyer. To learn more about the Cass and Young, you can check out Friends of the Cass and Young FOTCY Facebook group. It's actually pretty impressive. They got a ton of photos on there. Uh, the Cass and Young, of course, Fletcher class destroyer on display in Boston, Massachusetts. So, Buzz, thanks for joining us tonight. Are you, uh, how's your audio? Did we lose him? Buzz, are you there? Oh, like there he is. It looks like he's locked up. Buzz, are you able to hear us? Uh, we might have a bad internet connection. Uh, I mean, hmm. Can All right. you, uh, I can well, hear I'm you. Keep... Oh, can, can you hear us now? Oh, there you go. Okay. Yep. You're live. All right. So, um, yeah, one of the things I was wondering, are you, so are you a, a volunteer for the Cass and Young or what, in what capacity are you with the Cass and Young? Yes. I don't think. Yeah. I'm uh, one of approximately 20 volunteers. Uh, we've got two groups, if you will. Uh, one group does nothing but visitor experience, tours, etc. And then the wrench turner mm -hmm. um, people that actually do the work do the restorations on your yep, there she is yeah and you gave me of course you gave me a ton of photos um for the Cass and young but then what i what i did was i went on your facebook group as well and you guys have it seems like you've got a pretty healthy volunteer base um Let's see. So, yeah, of course, that's, uh, that's you built. right there. Yep, that's me. <laughs> uh, we've got uh, a hard core, if you will, of six or seven. Uh, mm. Another batch that show up when they can, because we've got folks that come all over to come out. And then uh, the group that does the tours and interacting with the visitors. Uh, what's unique about Cass and Young is... Uh, the ship is actually owned by the Navy. We're located on the same pier as the uh, USS Constitution. And the National Park Service has a memorandum of agreement with uh, the National Park Service. And the park has to maintain it and keep it open in a presentable condition. So uh, of all the museum ships, it's our understanding we're the only ones that are owned by the Navy, but they don't provide any support whatsoever no monetary on occasion we get sailors from the Constitution come over and volunteer and help out the work with their uh, volunteer service medals you know, like uh, two weeks ago the, uh, the ship was floating badly away from the pier so we had a group of bosons come over and us old guys can't pull lines anymore so they came over and got the ship back in where it belonged you know, I'm always kind of fascinated about how different museum ships operate. You know, some museum ships are owned by museums, private organizations. Others are owned by public uh, groups. 
you know, once a particular ship is donated to a city. So there's all kinds of different setups. Is it is it mm -hmm. an additional hassle to have the cast and young actually owned by the Navy yet? It doesn't provide any support. How, how, what's the dynamic there? Uh, I'm not going to say it's a hassle with the Navy at all, uh, because other than helping us out with manpower and some, some of the sailors like to come over and do tours with us as well. Okay. Uh, that's about it on the interaction with the Navy, the national park service. We've got, uh, four or five different offices, if you will, within the Boston national historic park. Mostly we work with maintenance. But then we have to work with an interpretation uh, who actually does the tours and the presentation uh, to purchase things. We have to work our way up through uh, administration if they're going to fund it. So um, it can be a challenge if you want to call it that. But uh, it's just something we deal with. That's how, how it works is it's, it's their ship. We're their guests. Um, and we work as close together as we can because we want to keep the ship alive and present it in the best way possible, just like every museum ship. Mm -hmm. And uh, we actually have that uh, FOTSI group, the Friends of the Cass and Young, is a 501c3. And I encourage you to go to our Facebook page to see some of the pictures of what we do. We try to post every time this is a, a work day. It, uh like I said and a few there moments ago. There's an address on there if you choose to donate. Yeah, well, and you uh, you sent me a, a, a ton of photos, a ton of amazing photos. I want to get into the history of the Cast and Young. Uh, but then there are also some mm -hmm. photos on the Facebook group, and we'll get to it, that I, I felt you overlooked. So I want to pull some of those up later. And I thought, you know, and, and let you tell some of the oh, stories. Sure. And so let's see. So obviously this is the... What's the right word for this? When you when the, is this the Cass and Young logo or I mean this patch. is a picture of pet. This yeah. is the ship. This is the ship's patch. Okay, uh, that was developed in the fifties. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one's pretty cool. I like that one. Um, and then <laughs> I think and is this that is Captain Cass and Young. Okay. So earlier, one of who was that that was asking about why it was called? The Cass and Young, was that Lego history? Um, or maybe there were a couple well, people. I believe yeah. so. Yes, people were were talking about who he was. Yeah, yeah. So, oh yeah, here we go. Yeah, so Lego. Uh, yeah, so yep. called the Cass and Young, um, and this is actually him right here. Yeah, I can, yeah, I can hit go that ahead. real quick, please. Yeah. Uh, Cass and Young was a, a Navy commander at the attack on Pearl Harbor. He was a commanding officer of the USS Vestal, which was a repair ship. And it was tied up right alongside the USS Arizona. And when the attack happened, he happened to be aboard the ship. And they had a boiler going uh, just to maintain steam. And he actually helped with manning a machine gun. And when the Arizona blew up, it blew him into the harbor, into the water, along with some other sailors. Uh, swam back, got back on the ship, cut the lines, uh, started getting it out of the way because Arizona at that point was burning furiously and decided that uh, he wasn't going to get out of the harbor. So he beached it uh, just like the Nevada, except he beached it going the opposite direction. Uh, Nevada tried getting out the bow where the uh, Vestal was facing the other way. So he beached it where the Pepsi-Cola plant is now. Uh, after Pearl Harbor, he was awarded the Medal of Honor and then given command of the, uh, um, yeah, I want to say San Francisco, but a heavy cruiser and was killed in action off of Guadalcanal during the cruiser battles um, there during the Guadalcanal campaign. So he was awarded That's the a Medal of history. Honor. He was awarded the Medal of Honor after the Pearl Harbor. He wasn't. It wasn't awarded to him posthumously. I guess is what I'm asking. After he died. Uh, no, he got awarded right after Pearl Harbor, okay. and actually had it hung. And uh, it, it was the San Francisco. I have my my cheat sheet in front of me, so I did look <laughs> it up. Uh, as I get brain dead every once in a while, but uh, mm -hmm. and as a matter of fact, the uh, 
as far as the Medal of Honor goes, the one that was hung around his neck is at the uh, Museum of the Pacific in Texas. Uh, there was one mounted in the wardroom uh, during the 1950s. And with the cooperation of uh, Commander Cass and Young III, the family loaned us what's called a replica Medal of Honor that was issued to the family members, along with an officer's saber of the appropriate age and type. So that display is back in the wardroom like it would have been in the 1950s. And the volunteers are very honored to be able to have that display put back up. That's what we do. So, mm -hmm. I think I'm kind of scrolling through some of the pictures you sent. Oh, wait, here we go. Here we go. Um, this might take a few moments, but I wanted to, thought it was a pretty cool picture. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Um, because I didn't actually know. I apologize. Let's see. There we go. Okay, so this guy right here. That's okay. Uh, yeah. So I'm assuming this is what you're talking about in the background. That's the saber. Okay, that's the play. Is, yes, that's Cass and Young's actual officer's saber. Uh, the okay. Medal of Honor and a plaque was donated by Mrs. Cass and Young. And then uh, underneath it's the ship's plaque. Um, Okay, that's what it looks like now, even though it's fuzzy. It's tough getting yeah, a good it, picture in the wardroom. It's pixelated. But, uh, that's for sure. What we did is we mounted everything on a hardwood uh, box with tempered glass for security. And then the ship's plaque the same way. One of our volunteers made the boxes. And then uh, we arranged uh, mounting metal, mounting the, the saber, and mounting mm -hmm. the plaque. Uh, Captain Ben Katz retired, donated an original ship's plaque to us. So uh, what the picture shows is that's Captain Hooper, H-O-O-P-E-R. He's swearing in that uh, uh, second class sailor is a uh, limited duty officer. That was one of the pictures we found going through the uh, archives. Mm. So, and we were able to, you can, you can see the line right around their heads where the, uh, mm -hmm. the bulkhead was welded. Yeah. We've got everything mounted as close as we can to that same location. Mm. So oh, that, that's okay. something we're really proud of. Yeah, you can just barely see the line right underneath that fan. And mm -hmm. when you look yeah. at the other picture, you'll see everything's just a little lower because we had to drill and tap the, the bulkhead to mount it. And there's a that's beam fun. there. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, I, I, I wish this picture was a little better. I don't, I don't know why it's so, so fuzzy, but yeah. Um, I think that's pretty cool. Okay, so let's let me let me get back on track here. I wanted to we have so the cats, better picture. The cats, Facebook yeah. page. What's that? Oh, let's see. Yep. So the cats, it's got a pretty interesting history, at least when I was reading about it. Um, and you had sent. Oh, uh, here we go. Oh, actually, before before we get to that. So among among the photos that you sent, you also sent this one, which I thought was actually a pretty interesting photo. I don't know what the history is or what's going on here, but I just like the picture. That's a picture from the mid fifties. Uh, one of the alterations that was made at the Boston Navy Yard, that's why we ended up with this ship. Uh, they put in a Mark 32 anti-submarine torpedo system. Um, what you see underneath the sailor on the right is one of those Mark 32 torpedoes, but that's a training torpedo. That's mm. why it's painted the color it is. So after you do your drill and it floats back up to the surface, you can go find it. Uh, you don't want a color that matches the ocean. You want something nice and bright so you can go recover it. Uh, the Navy loaned us one of these and it was getting quite rusty and uh, being exposed to the weather since the 70s. So we got permission from the Navy and the National Park curator because of this picture. And we painted the one that we have exactly like this. And it's oh, a real cool. attention getter. That's on the starboard side, uh, just forward of uh, what was the uh, weapons office on the main deck. And they had two launchers and two reloads for each loader, or each launcher on port and starboard. Uh, the system didn't work worth a hoot. Um, started getting replaced by the ASRock system. 
which is what we had on the ships that I was on as ASRock. Uh, destroyer why, why escort slash frigate, by the way. Why didn't it work? What went wrong? It's got a built-in sonar. Um, it, it it just wasn't. You gotta you gotta get close to the submarine, and whenever you're close to a submarine, they can hear you. <laughs> so they just you know, if you ever watched Red October, you know how they do that crazy Ivan. Mm -hmm. Well, you you do the same thing with a destroyer. If you got a submarine, as soon as you hear the propellers that close, you do thing and get out of the way. And this thing just didn't have a strong enough sonar to, to work all that well. And luckily, we didn't have to use them anyway. You know, that's, that's mm -hmm. the way it is. The ASRock fires uh, with a rocket. Okay. Yeah, I think that I think that was a question earlier when I was talking about the Mark 32s. They were like, was it part of the ASRock system? And we just moved on. So our system would be the same as your system. So it was the version and the modification before the ASRock, I believe. Yeah, I'm trying to find that uh, video. Rather. Uh, there we go. Let's see. Yeah, I can't find that question. I was going to. So that's what that's all about. Up. Let's see. All right. Um, when it comes to the history of the Cass and Young, you sent a couple of diagrams. And I I, yes. I found this kind of interesting. I wasn't aware that it was actually hit twice uh, by, you know, kamikaze attacks. And I'm going to let you dig into this here. But this is, this is a diagram detailing the first kamikaze hit on April 12th, 1945. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, we actually got strafed once as well with five wounded in action. Uh, this was the first major hit. Um, they had uh, a whole batch of these Val dive bombers attacking off of Okinawa. Uh, they shot down most of them, but one of them came into the, the Cass and Young, and they think the uh, pilot may have been killed because he hit the uh, the upper radar mast. The, the picture in the middle, you can see the top is cut off. Mm -hmm. And then you can see the radar and the picture on the lower left hanging there by the stack. Uh, we lost one sailor and had 60 wounded in action. Um, lots of damage to the ship. You can still see some of it, by the way, if you know where to look. Uh, we've been kind of interested in painting the areas red, but uh, because this is the 1950s, we can't do that. So, uh, so anyhow, uh, that was our first one. That was in April 1945. Uh, they went back to uh, Ulithi Atoll and had the mast replaced by a ship that was going to be scuttled that had been damaged worse. And uh, they just moved the uh, the mast over from this other ship onto Cass and Young. And then uh, once it was repaired, uh, did some more tests and then back up to Okinawa. And oh, this would be. Oh, go ahead. Well. So you were saying that you can still see, as the ship sits today, you can still see some of the damage from that hit. Yes, and this one as well. Oh, okay. Well, go ahead and tell us about the second attack. Okay. Uh, the second attack, they were down on uh, radar picket number eight, uh, down south of Okinawa. The first one was up north in uh, uh, radar picket number one, which was absolutely the worst place. <laughs> But uh, 3 a.m. in uh, off Okinawa, they were cruising in their position. Uh, a Betty bomber, uh, which they feel was guiding these kamikaze aircraft in, ended up getting shot down way away from the ship. Uh, this is a cloth and wood biplane with either a bomb or explosives in it, one pilot. And the feeling from... Uh, uh, the captain's after-action report is he probably followed the wake of the ship, which in the Pacific, um, you can actually see the phosphorescence and follow it. And he came in from the stern, and that's when they picked him up. They couldn't depress the guns. Uh, they were firing as best they could, but uh, they didn't hit him. And he's awfully slow. Uh, we in a biplane, and you can see on the diagram that he came up from the stern, up the starboard side, 
and then dove right into the uh, motor whale boat that was hanging there. Went through it and into the forward boiler room and exploded inside the boiler room, killing everybody in there either instantly or shortly thereafter. Uh, lots of other damage about the ship. Um, we had one sailor then that up missing was declared killed in action later. Uh, they found his life jacket floating and that was it. Uh, 21 killed, 45 wounded. Um, I saw somebody talk about uh, the medical in the wardroom on one of your comments. Uh, most of the serious injuries went to the wardroom. Uh, lesser injuries went to sick bay and minor injuries went to aft birthing. Uh, the interesting part of this hit is uh, the ship went dead in the water. Of course, it, they lost steam. They had flooding and they had fires. Uh, damage control works. Uh, they had the ship uh, cross-connected onto the aft boiler and engine room and fires put out and casually starting to get treated and dewatering in 25 minutes. Uh, this is the damage from the second hit. Uh, you can see the big hole in the deck and to the right side of the top picture, you can see there used to be a motor whale boat. There's a davit there. And the second picture on the right, you can see the davit. Oh, I see and it. it. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the, the and you can see the hole right behind it. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, all of these pictures, by the way, were taken by uh, Dr. Savesma, who was the ship's doctor. Um, he was the official ship's photographer from the previous commander. But uh, the other thing that uh, when we go back live, I'll, I can show you something. But uh, this whole area was destroyed. Uh, every time I go in that boiler room, it, it just, uh, you think about it. You think about this hit and the sailors that were down there. Because having been a sailor and being a, a corpsman, it's just unbelievable, this type of damage. Uh, so, the day before... So you were a, you were a, a sailor and, and you were a yes. corpsman? Yes. Yeah. Uh, 84 to 98, I was in the Navy as a corpsman. Okay. Uh, I did two ships, Navy Reserve, all reserve time in the Navy, but uh, two hospitals, two ships, and then got commissioned in the Air Force and retired as a light colonel. So what a country. <laughs> Started off as a third class petty officer and all the way to light colonel. Uh, it, something to show the viewers. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Going back to the damage, that is a piece of the outer hull of the ship. And the important part is that. Uh, let me get it here with the camera because everything's backwards. That is the hull of the ship. That's a yeah. reason why they call it a tin can. Um, you can put a rifle bullet through it. They're all electric class destroyer. Even the gun mounts look like they're armored. They're not. They're just plate steel. Uh, the only armor, per se, was a double layer around the uh, boiler and engine rooms. That's it. So you have yeah. a 250-pound bomb go off. That's a lot of damage. Well, and I wanted to ask you about... Let me see if I can pull this up real quick. The previous diagram, if you want to call it that. So this thing, okay. So here, let me let me let me back up one more. Okay. So the first kamikaze hit, yep. in a sense, it makes sense because it's a val dive bomber, and y you know you you were aware of that. You know they, those were heavily used, but then this this second attack in July is simply. A trainer, like you said, it's a fabric-covered wooden plane, extremely slow, and but it sounds like it actually caused the most damage. And is that because of what you said a few moments ago, the fact that it pretty much just flew in wave top so low the guns couldn't depress and it kind of snuck in? Correct. Yep. Uh, the, the, the day before, uh, the USS Callahan, another Fletcher, was hit by one of these same planes mm. about 15 feet lower at the waterline, and she sunk. Oh, wow. uh, Cass and Young survived because the guy hit at the main deck. He hit, the, hit that boat and then into the main deck. So they mm. were able to keep the ship afloat. So, and I see the comment, yes, the, uh, the radar pickets got creamed off of Okinawa, and that was their job. That the small boys protect the big boys and the landing craft. That's our job. 
Oh, wow. Well, yeah, it, it, it was a, there was a tactic. The, the Bettys were uh, the bird dog, if you will. They would find the fleet and bring the kamikazes and then hopefully get back. But uh, a lot of this particular attack on the, the July 30th, they shot down a lot of them. But once they got inside, uh, the night fighters had to leave. Now, this was 3 a.m. It's, it's not dark. It was full moon. So mm -hmm. they could see. They could see well enough to get in there. And uh, that's what happened. And they wounded so many, including the captain who was up on the bridge. He was up on the bridge wing looking, having the ship turned to starboard to try to get some more guns to bear. And that's when they got hit. And how many did you say, how many casualties from that second hit? The second one, uh, I thought it just I flipped. It was I, off. Hold on a second. Let yeah. me back up. Uh, 22, I, killed, uh, 40, 22 killed, 45 wounded. And a 22 because a one MIA was uh, declared uh, killed in, I think it was 1947. Because they never found is. him and they started declaring all the missing at that point. And what's yeah. a compliment for Fletcher at this point? Was it like 250 something at this like that? point? About three and a quarter, 325. Okay. Uh, so full compliment. Losing, you always have people that coming and going. Guys is pretty substantial. Yeah. 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 Uh, medical wise, we had one doctor, uh, mm -hmm. one chief corpsman, one uh, first class corpsman, and then one third class corpsman, uh, which for a ship this size, that's a good size medical department. But again, it's a war. So uh, the ships nowadays, the one I were on, no doctor. The only we'd, we'd take a group doctor out with us when we were out training, but he wasn't assigned to the ship. He was just a uh, surface group four surgeon. And he liked to get out of the office, so he'd come out with us. Let, let's get into the Cass and Young as a museum ship now in Boston. Um, you sent along, as I keep saying, you sent along a ton of great pictures, great photographs. And so how long has the Cass and Young been sitting in Boston? She was uh, brought up in the 70s. Uh, the When they converted the Boston name to the Boston National Historic Park, which is the current name that was the one back then, they wanted a ship that was built there. Uh, the only one that's still around that was built in Boston is the former USS Charette, which is now known okay. as the Velos over in Greece. That was actually okay. built in Boston. Uh, they're not going to give it up. So they started looking around and they found Cass and Young and mothballs in Philadelphia because she'd been transferred from the Pacific to the Atlantic fleet and then uh, mothballed in 1960. So in the 90s, they acquired it from the name and towed it up because she can't get underway her on her own power ever. And uh, she was upgraded in Boston five times. That's why it was so attractive to, to bring her to Boston. Uh, that's a older picture of her in dry dock. Uh, dry dock number one, which still exists and is still in use by the, uh, the Constitution. And us. Uh, uh, well, when's, when's the last it time it took them several years to uh, right before I started. So I've been there eight years. So about 10 years ago and the uh, park is working on getting the funds out of Washington and the plan to get it in in five years from today. So there is a plan to get it in the dry dock. Uh, the last time that's how I got this piece of plate is they ended up replacing a lot of the hull them at the edge of the water line. And uh, I couldn't find the pictures, but we do have pictures of her with her rib showing, which is pretty awesome. So, yeah. Um, One of so, the, and um, we're, we're birthed right in front of that dry dock. We, we actually are right in front of that. And if Ca uh, Constitution has to go in in a hurry, we get towed out into the harbor and Constitution goes in. There you go. That's the last dry dock session there. Yeah, so like I was saying, yes, a few we do still have ago, our propellers. The, the Facebook group that you guys have is is really impressive. Tons of photos. This isn't a photo that you included. I just kind of lifted this off the Facebook page. I 
I loved seeing this. We yeah. we talk a lot about getting the USS the Sullivans, you know, wanting to see that get into dry dock. And what what kind of things when the when the Cass and Young ended up in dry dock, what, what kind of things did what kind of things were repaired? What kind of things were discovered? Are you able to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, again, I wasn't there, but uh, I'm good friends with our volunteer side coordinator, Steve. And he, he takes pictures left, right, and center. A lot of those pictures are his. Uh, they replaced a lot of hull plates. Uh, they did a, a complete survey of the hull. Uh, found, we had no, uh, no water incursions. It was just uh, thin spots that they found. And it was decided they had enough money so that Uh oh. So there was quite a and then replay deal. Do have a function system that's on the We should we have him log off and maybe log back on? And stuff was, like that. It does help. Uh, we've got one propeller that's got just a tight. It, it's got a little bit of a leak, just that what I like to call the green crud around the bolts, which means there's seawater coming in around the bolts, and that's planned to get fixed during the dry dock period. But we made sure to secure that uh, watertight hatch. We just dogged that sucker right down. So if something happens, the water should not get out of that space. But, uh, and, and did you say, did you say a few moments yeah, ago as, that as, you want to as she, get it You've got to keep the water out. Five years? Mm -hmm. Uh, you it, broke uh, up a little. Oh, I'm sorry. Bit. Could I you just, repeat for him? Yeah. Did you say that you wanted to see the uh, the Cassian Young back in dry dock in about five years? Yes. Uh, the supervisor of maintenance for the park has told us that uh, he's working on the actual dry dock plan and funding. So that would make it about 15, 16 years since the last dry dock. And that's a, a good schedule. You know, we, we want to get it in there before there's any noticed problems. Now, I'm sure you were probably aware of when the the Sullivans took on water. Uh, let's see what Shane, that's going on almost a year ago, right? April 14. Yeah. What over at the Cass and Young, because you guys are also a Fletcher class destroyer. Uh, what what were your thoughts when when you heard that the the Sullivans had started taking on water? Uh, oh, yes, if you will, <laughs> uh, it was scary, if you will. Um, we sat down and you know tried to come up with a plan on our end of it. Uh, if they're far enough away, there wasn't an awful lot of help we could give them, other than you know support in the background, which I know Slater was a lot closer. They sent some folks up, but we started looking, okay, where can we get pumps? What type of pumps does the park have? And then the simple things. If you've got a storage area down below water that you're not into all the time, close it. And that's what we did. We started closing up the magazines, closing up uh, like the uh, 20 millimeter lockers, uh, flag storage lockers, all that stuff we tried to close up. Uh, the difficulty, if you will, is a lot of them have rubber gaskets. Mm -hmm. And if they're new, they were new in the 1950s. Yep. So with one of our other plans is we've got to come up with a place to get new gasket material, start replacing gaskets so that when you tighten them down, you're not tightening them down on a piece of rubber that's like a piece of concrete. Same with our watertight doors in the main deck. We're having an awful time with rust. Uh, we're jealous of the Slater because uh, they can fix them. Uh, we have to hire a contractor, and he's supposed to come aboard next week and start taking a hatch at a time, watertight door at a time, and uh, start repairing them. But it did give us a, a bit of a wake-up call. Uh, the park has one large-scale um, air driven pump. We've got several small pumps and we identified where we could rent 
big ones. But uh, as all of us, we all hope it never gets to that stage. That's the worst scenario for all of us. When, um, you know, when the, when the Sullivans took on water, I imagine, and what, one of the comments, uh, this is when we first started all talking together, uh, you know, John, it just, it just kind of changes a, a way a museum ship has to, well, well, any museum ship that's in the water, I should say, it just kind of changes the way you guys look at your daily operations, keeping doors closed, maybe increased inspections. And I'm assuming that's the kind of stuff you were looking at. Yes. Okay. And so on your Facebook page, <laughs> you know, you have, you have a lot of photos, a lot of incredible photos. And when I see something like this, I'm assuming this is almost a daily challenge that you and your volunteers uh, come across. I don't know what that picture is. Uh, I know it's something that needs to be fixed, but uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure when and where it was taken, to be honest with you. Well, uh, there's there's a that, difference. Any anybody that was at the HNSA conference in Honolulu, this is this is bad. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, and there's a difference, a little bit of a difference anyway, or maybe I'm wrong. But when you talk about the Slater and you talk about the vessels at the Buffalo Naval Park, they're right now surrounded by fresh water, and you guys are in salt water. So that that's got to be more challenging. We're actually in what's called brackish. Uh, right inboard of us, if you will, is the uh, exit of the Charles River, uh, which is fresh water. And it, it comes into that area right around the Charlestown Navy Yard and mixes with salt water. Uh, and that is why it's so important to have that cathodic protection system, because you do have a lot of salt. Um, it's something that it's checked, like I said, monthly. Uh, we also have uh, our soundings taken. We've got one of the Constitution sailors who did it. Active duty wants to come over once a month and take soundings, which we're more than happy to have her come on over. Any help we can get like that's great. Now, this is one of the one of the other pictures that you sent me, which it's a pretty amazing picture. Everything looks super clean, nice and painted. What are we looking at here? Okay, you're on the bow right behind Mount 51. Uh, you've got the ship's bell, of course. Uh, we actually had one of our volunteers make the new striker for it because the striker was missing. Somebody had painted it with some kind of varnish or something. So I, I one of my projects, I took it down to the bare bronze and polished it. Uh, the fire hoses, one of our volunteers, Tim, uh, takes them home and bleaches them to get the, the green goo, the mold and stuff off them. Hmm. The tank that's in the foreground actually came from the USS uh, um, North Carolina. Uh, they they gave it to us. They had several on the ship, and we'd been looking for one. It's a foam proportioner. It doesn't belong on the bow, but we put it up there because it's protected. Uh, uh, one of our two, actually, a couple of our volunteers restored it, and we decided to place it there. Uh, there's two separate tanks inside of that thing with two separate uh, setups for foam so that when you're fighting oil fires, there it is when we got it. Uh, uh, one of the volunteers in the North Carolina lives in Maryland, and I happen to be going to the, uh, the Maryland Antique Arm Show down there, and he brought it to Maryland, and I picked it up in Maryland and brought it home. And the company that made it is still in existence. And you can see there's a decal on the face of it. They sent us a picture of the decal. And we had them made exactly as it was. And then uh, we've, I believe we sent some up to the Slater and uh, yep. some down to the North Carolina. And you don't see it there, but there's a decal going on it uh, once the weather turns and the metal's warm enough. But uh, well, that's uh, well, the like forward said, firefighting uh, station. Like I said a few months ago, you, you, you know, you sent some great pictures, this being one of them, but you did not provide this one, which is some of the fascinating stuff that you've got on your Facebook, uh, on your, on your Facebook page and taking a step further, you know, you've got photos of your volunteers, you know, doing a lot of dirty work. What, 
how how strong or how how extensive is your volunteer group? How how many volunteers do you have, and what kind of stuff do you have them doing? Sure, as uh, with every organization, you've got a lot on paper. Uh, so we've got about twenty five, give or take. Uh, we've always got folks coming and going, either because it's not what they want to do or health issues. Um, unfortunately, some of them have passed away. But uh, that was one of our newer, if you will, volunteers, uh, uh, Billy. Uh, he's actually a retired electrician. This is our other Billy, which drives us crazy trying to figure out which one we're talking about. Uh, Billy's retired Air Force, this gentleman. Uh, the other Billy's a retired uh uh, we call them brown shoe Navy. Uh, Shane would know what that is. Them <laughs> darn air dills that still call things floors and ceilings. And, uh, they're aviation. Um, but how, volunteers are a different breed of cat. Uh, you can't have someone that acts like a, an officer ordering them around. Because they'll leave. They're volunteers. <laughs> so we're all equal. We have a coordinator because the park wanted one. But... Uh, we try to identify projects we want to do. And that's how you get the best work out of people is, you know, what do you feel like doing? And a lot of them will just say, well, what needs to get done? Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's on all hands. Like this coming Saturday, we've got to clear one of the uh, storage areas up at the, uh, the park because a lot of our stuff is in there that isn't displayed and the building's going to be rehabbed. So we've got to take out what we want, get it to the ship, and then allow the rest of it to be disposed of. Um, and honestly, for your other ships, nothing good. Uh, mm. Nothing we can actually pass off. Uh, we may end up with some uh, of the waist belt type life jackets, but that's about it. But, uh, and that's on all hands. That's something we have to do. The rest of it, this guy is a sick individual. He loves to paint. <laughs> I hate to paint. But, but he'll do anything. Yeah, uh, we brought him in on a volunteer service weekend. Uh, we do that every year now. Uh, he's a part of my VFW uh, post. And we usually get about six or eight volunteers from uh, the disabled veterans and the VFW. And they just come in and do whatever we ask them to do for a day. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a great project that one of our other volunteers, Bird Dog, uh, we had uh, four different colors of upholstery in the enlisted cruise mess. And we found what the original color was back in the 50s, and it was this oddball-looking tan. So we had a private donor that donated the money to have every piece of upholstery done. And this volunteer and a couple of others took them all to the upholstery shop and then brought them all back and then repainted all of the, the framework while the cushions were out. Hey, so, Buzz. Uh, that's the type uh, of projects hey, we do. Hey, Buzz, uh, how long did that bench project take? Do you, do you know offhand? Uh, not as long as you'd think. A, a big project, this, the vendor we had just dove right into it. The, the plus was we brought him the cushions. If he'd have had to come to the ship and take them down and then bring them back and put them back together, the, the price would have been crazy. Mm -hmm. But uh, he did it in pieces. We'd bring them. You know, a batch of pieces up, he'd do them, we'd bring them back, bring them up some more. But uh, it was in the, the case of months, not years. Okay, great. Thank you. What, why? Is that something you, you're thinking about doing on the Sullivan, Shane? Well, we have to, right? The, uh, you know, the mess oh, deck, yeah. the mess deck got ruined, you know? So uh, we've removed all of the benches that you'd see. We have similar benches here. Uh, and so now we're working uh to you know that's one of the things in my wheelhouse is to get them reupholstered so just looking at if you said it was a month or two or uh you know that kind of gives me a guideline that i can follow as well do you guys have uh do you just have benches like that or we have like a lot of four-man tables too uh we've got a lot of them we've got the benches okay. on the bulkheads and then the yep. four-man tables in the middle oh yeah and right. then yep and then we've got uh a uh, this one, I believe he's painting is, uh, it's not a table. It's like a bench and it's got to fold down so you can put sailors nod. Mm. So we've got a few of those as well running down the, uh, the center of the mess. You'd be skinny to get into them 
four man tables. I don't, I don't fit. <laughs> uh, I mean, Shane, Shane, when you see some of these pictures, I obviously the, are you, do you pick up on the similarity between the Cass and Young and the, the Sullivan's or are the ships quite a bit different after World War II, after reconfiguration, all that stuff? No, I, I the Cass and Young and the Sullivan's are probably much closer than say the Cass, than the, the Sullivan's and the kid or the Cass and Young and the kid. Okay. These are, they're very similar. We have that yeah. Mark 32 triple torpedoes. Uh, you guys, I think, are also had your Mount 53 removed like we did. Um, do you have a picture of the overview of the? Uh, uh, actually, the, no. Uh, oh. Oh, you have? Well, uh, hold on a second. I don't know if I've got an overhead shot or not. So you have, you have Mount 53 on yours, Buzz? We lost him again. Okay. Yeah. Hold on a second, though. I thought there was. A... Yeah, I just thought offhand the Mount 53 had been removed, but I could be wrong. I mean, I guess I could look, try and find an overhead shot, too. Nah, but... And this, this picture doesn't. There we are. We're back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. There, The Mount 53 is there at the time. So you must not have a three inch 50 on yeah. the aft superstructure. No, we've got quad 40s between the stacks, uh, one on each side. Uh, that was one of the changes. Uh, you can see the, uh, the mast is a tripod. That's 1950s. And uh, they removed all the 20s. Uh, the only guns that are original are the, the five inch and then there's one twin 40 uh, on the stern. That was original to World War II as well as the five inch. Uh, a lot of extensive modifications in the 1950s. That's the World War II version right there. Yeah. In the well, original you know, camo when, when you originally sent these pictures, I just thought, okay, World War II, there's the uh, camouflage and everything, but I actually did not pay attention. You're right. So you look at this picture, and above the superstructure, there's nothing, and then you take a look at what was added in the 50s, quite a bit different. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, so they still, they still have uh, national park guidelines. Go what do you train. mean uh, with national park guidelines? What are you talking about mm. there? <laughs> uh, you have to pick a period when you're presenting. So we have to present the ship as the 19, 1950 to 1960, because that's the configuration that she's in. And then the visitors usually realize it's, you know, it served in World War II and a lot of questions about that. Uh, so we kind of get into that with the visitors, but the ship itself is configured for 1950s. Now, it, during World War II, you showed that picture of the camo, the camouflage. It was repainted in the Pacific to what they call uh, ocean blue, which they thought was a better camouflage than this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Unique thing about the Pacific is you've got all of the plankton that when your propellers go through the water at certain times, you get phosphorescence. Mm -hmm. So you can find the ship usually, uh, especially from the air. And then, of course, back in the 50s, it went to haze gray and underway. So uh, it, it, we actually found all those colors when we were uh, needle scaling. Actually, Tim is a maniac with a needle scaler and found all the way to the zinc chromate primer and some red lead primer mm -hmm. and wow. then the camouflage and then the blue and then the gray so we've got a wow. little piece with a, a frame that shows all the colors fabulous uh shane john what other questions uh do you guys have for for buzz and the cast and young i have two go ahead um he mentioned the the, the foam applicator yeah the the decal so we uh top yeah. of my head Slater, we have we have three currently that I can think of. Uh Barry Whitty, who of course worked uh with Shane. Um they sent us the, 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 the label for the foam applicator and he and some midshipmen have been working to repaint the applicators and put the decals on. 
Uh, actually, it's a small world. <laughs> One of the foam applicators is currently in our aft um, washroom right now. Every Saturday, the midshipmen come in and they are <laughs> currently working on repainting um, mm. one of the foam applicators right now. Um, other thing, way back to the beginning of the broadcast, because I forgot. Uh, so the cast of Young, we talked about who it's named for. Um, he, uh, When he was commanding the San Francisco, our namesake, Frank Slater, was on the San Francisco, and he was killed only hours before mm. Cass and Young was killed. Uh, Frank was killed in the air attack oh, on the wow. 12th uh, when the plane crashed into the 20 millimeter aft. Okay. Yep. So, yeah. Cass Young was the commanding officer of Frank Slater. Small world. Yeah. No and oh, yeah. I, now I, I kind of mentioned to Ken earlier. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I can ask my question later. Uh, on the bridge with Cass and Young was Admiral Callahan, who yep. they named one of the other Fletchers after, and Cass and Young and through the whole Pacific, and it was the Callahan that got sunk the day before Cass and Young got hit. So, mm. Now we've got another connection to, uh, to Slater. It's like, wow. Okay. Um, do you know anything about her uh, history in the Mediterranean in the 50s? I was reading about it, and Cassie Young was operating with, um, with in Greece for a little while uh, with the Navy. Um, and of course, Slater was in the Greek Navy at the same exact time. So I, I, I'm i willing to bet Cassie Young and Slater probably operated together in the 50s um, in the Mediterranean, which is pretty cool. Uh, they probably did. I would guess so. Uh, one of our volunteers, Bob uh, Harris, is really into the history. I can find out from him. Uh, okay, he's, great. He's into the weeds. He's the one that did those diagrams, by the way. Uh, what oh, I do okay. know about uh, the Mediterranean is we found a letter from uh, the uh, uh, shop company, uh, APCO, Ask from the uh, company telling the Cass and Young that no, we don't have anybody that can fix your soda shop machine in the Mediterranean. <laughs> so we know it had one and we mm. chased one for about five or six years. I gave you a, a picture of it, Ken. Uh, we happened to find on when I got closing his antique shop in Pennsylvania. Um. And we were there in two days and, and completely restored it and put it back on the mess deck. Um, I think it, it's probable find this uh, they don't the company exists, but they don't make that machine anymore. Are you talking about this right here? Uh, it's it's on the mess deck on the uh that's yeah, the that's puppy it. right there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's it's, the, it's a little uh, pixelated. We had, I didn't actually... we had the gut it all the, the, the machinery inside. I didn't know what this was. I thought it was some kind of like electrical panel or something like that. And then it comes to find out it's a soda machine. I think that's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, uh, it was a type that used a syrup. You tie it into the, uh, the water system on the ship and mm. then it fed the syrup yeah. and the carbon dioxide into it and dropped a little four ounce cup down uh, into that opening in the front. And uh, we mm. it cost you a nickel. And when we were looking for one, one of the gunner's mates that served aboard in the 50s told us that what he'd do when they were at uh, condition two, uh, which had the gun manned, and uh, he'd go down below with everybody's nickels and bring a number 10 tomato can, one of those big cans from the, uh, the galley, and fill the can up, and then bring the can <laughs> and the cups back up to the gun mount. So we knew it had one, but... Uh, it was just an incredible find, and you know we couldn't get to Pennsylvania fast enough to go get it. <laughs> and we had the proof that it was on the ship, so you know, it's it's back uh, aboard. It doesn't work. It, it'll never work. We got it. We had to. What uh, what other questions you guys have uh, have for uh, Buzz? Anything? No, else? I think um, I think. I've been seeing a lot of comments about the torpedoes, so there seems to be a lot of action, at least in the comments about the torpedoes. Mm -hmm. I do want to say the Sullivan's had quintuple 
not quadruple. All right, so their torpedo tubes were five. I think that was standard across all Fletchers. So for Lego Sam, they weren't quads. They were quintuple five. Uh, just got to say. And then the three, the Mark 32 uh, anti ASW. Uh, yeah, we're really excited. I've talked to Buzz a few times uh, this year along with the kid. Uh, the kid is in mostly her World War II configuration. Um, that's what we're working on, too. When we were at Hinza together and I met Buzz for the first time, uh, he talked about the furnishing plan that was created by the National Park Service. Uh, so he sent me a copy of that, and I'm going to kind of mimic that with some changes uh, for USS The Sullivans when she gets back from dry dock, and we can kind of bring some more authenticity back uh, to The Sullivans as well, using that as a guidepost, uh, their furnishing plan, uh, uh, you know, as an example and something that we could uh, mimic in, in a roundabout way. So we're really happy about that. And of course, the 80th anniversaries of the Fletchers, uh, the kid, Cass and Young, Sullivans, and the Velos in Greece, as you guys have talked about. And uh, so we're working to do some joint projects uh, or displays or some roundtable discussions throughout the year. Uh, and that will hopefully start in April. So that's something we're really excited about too. <laughs> when, you talk, when you talk about two Fletcher class destroyers that were modified in the 50s after World War II, so there's, they're still pretty similar. And, you know, whether it's Shane, you look at the Cass and Young or maybe Buzz looks at the, the Sullivans. Do you guys see like different, it could be as simple as a soda machine. I don't know. But do you see certain things that, oh, yeah, I'll bet that was on the Sullivans. I wish we had that. You know, you use the um, the foam applicator as an example. Um you know, so do you see pieces of equipment like that that you wish you had and maybe like you plan like a night raid? Maybe we can steal it. <laughs> you know, I tell you, Ken, you're you know, fabulous sometimes. Well, but I mean, uh, all joking aside, I mean, do, do you do you see like Buzz, do you see stuff on the Sullivan's? It's like, yeah, we we could get that. I think, I think uh, one of the things that every museum ship needs to start thinking about is that there's no scrounging at the, the bone. There's nothing of our age left in Philadelphia or out at uh, um, Susan Island or down in California or up in Washington State. So we need to work together, actors that we can uh, parlay into something else we have to, because you're not going to get us off of a, a, a 1970s uh, fast frigate, uh, FFG, you know, the uh, guided missile frigate, the same stuff. The watertight doors may be the same, but because they're being towed, won't let you take any off. So uh, that's why we have to repair them. But uh, yeah, but yeah I, it's, 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 I think we all want to be the kid when we grow up. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that was, um, I would say that, yeah, this is, this 80th anniversary is like a great first step to collaborating. And I did not know Buzz before Hawaii and Henza. And now we have a, a, a good working relationship. And how I kind of see this going is, hey, you know, how's this equipment? And maybe what we could do or that equipment or and maybe what I see is us doing joint orders for something, which would be really cool. Now we're pooling resources together. We could each use five of whatever. I don't even know. Oh, we need 40 millimeter clips or something, right? And we can maybe joint order them instead of us just ordering our own and them they ordering their own. We could do a joint thing where we order 10 or 15 and then it would be split among the two uh, vessels, I think, would be something that I can kind uh, don't, of see. Don't forget the Slater has 40 millimeters, too. Oh, <laughs> the, the Slater. Let's all get in. You want to include let's... us on that order. That'd be good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but, you know, so I kind of see it just like right off the top. We had an ice cream machine. Yeah. And I'm I neglected to say we all want to really be the Slater. <laughs> right. Oh, really? Is, is the Slater the benchmark? Well, you know. I, Were you I guys... Know. I hear a lot. Slater oh, yeah. was lucky oh, because yeah. it, the, so I, I think out of the three vessels here, yeah, the Slater was in service relatively um, 
not too long ago, 30 years ago, 1991, she was decommissioned. So the Greeks, they brought the Slater, uh, Slater, the Greeks brought Itos into dry dock in 91. They did like a day long dry dock for us in 93 before they gave the ship back. Ooh. And then we did a dry dock in 2014 and a dry dock in 2020. So the ship was, her hull was in reasonably good condition before she even became a museum. So we've been fortunate in that mm-hmm. regard. Yeah. And the uh, reason it might be hard to get some of these, um, besides the ships being gone, but going to, to salvage parts, um, our director, Tim Rizzuto, is kind of known for being, um, <laughs> he, he goes to anywhere he can and and, and gets things. And he's been doing this in the 70s. Tim, Tim's known yeah. for being resourceful. Yeah. I'm not saying he was patted down at a Henser conference on the Midway before he <laughs> left, but um, he mm-hmm. may have been patted down. <laughs> so I was just joking, but the idea of like doing a night raid on a on a, another museum ship isn't out of the question when it comes to Tim being mm. involved. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and okay, final question, uh, Buzz. Before we let you go, is anyone in contact with? the Greek Fletcher, the Velos. Does anyone have any kind of regular communication with those guys? Or do they try and communicate with you? Have you guys ever heard from them? Nothing. I mean, I saw Shane, you shook your head. Nothing, no communication with the Greeks at all. No, I I, I was kind of waiting for the lag with Boz to come in on that. But uh, we have, you know, for the Fletchers for the 80th, we've said, oh, I might have a contact, let me check. And then they come back a week later and say, oh, no, I don't actually have a contact. Or I used to have a contact, but they don't work there anymore in Greece. So uh, our our boss, uh, Paul Marzello, is going to Greece, uh, I think, this sometime this summer, but he's not going around Thessaloniki, where uh, the ship is docked. So... Mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I said, Greece isn't that big though, you know, so uh, you could probably get there in two hours or three hours or something, depending. But, uh, so I think we've tried as of right now to make a a full faith effort to like reach out, um, uh, you know, but yeah, the language barrier maybe, uh, you know. (laughs) Yeah. I tried reaching out to them a couple weeks ago and I haven't heard anything back. (laughs) So yeah, I think, uh, you know, it might be one of those things, but we are still going to honor. We were talking about it just today. We're thinking of getting a flag for the Greek Navy uh, for the USS Velo or the USS Charette uh, HS Velos. I think it's the designation is HS. Is that right? You would know that, John, maybe. It's, I'm it, sorry, it, I wasn't it, listening. It's HS, is, it's Hellenic ship, right? Hellenic yeah. ship. Yeah, oh, yes, kind of HS, yes. Okay, yep. so uh, I think we might get a flag of the Greek Navy and maybe fly that. We, we've already just purchased the kids' pirate flag for the 80th. Hopefully you guys have the Shamrock flag, maybe Cass and Young, or maybe not. I don't know. We could talk about that at another time. But uh, And then Buzz has been working on a ship flag uh, using the patch. Uh, you know, to see how that goes, and then we'd fly that as well. So that's one of those small things that we can do. Uh, but I think we've made a full faith effort to reach out to the yeah, Velos. Clark's actually left us a really, really good. Oh, go ahead, Buzz. You were talking about Park yeah. Stevenson. Park sent us a really good JPEG of the uh, the, the rooster. So we're probably going to make Excellent. one with the rooster. Excellent. Um, I would like to see that. Yeah, hopefully, and we'll stay in touch with, because we'd like to get that for, I think yours is May. Is your commissioning in May? I can't remember offhand. I think. December. Oh, your December 31st? Yeah, that's okay. I always yes. get that confused. Yep, December uh, 31st. Kid in April, then you guys, and then, then us at the end, and then the, the Velos would be a little there somewhere. Yeah, the Velos must be in May. The Charette must be in May. We're in uh, September, and the new guys in December. So, yeah, so so as I said earlier, 80th anniversary, we're doing stuff specific for the Sullivans, but then we're going to do a joint thing as well. So hopefully everyone can tune into that. We're going to do some live sessions on YouTube, things, so uh, talking about the ships. So that's really exciting. 
Well, Buzz, I want to thank you for joining us tonight and telling telling us all about the the Cass and Young. Uh, learned a couple of new things. Uh, is there anything else you want us to know about the Cass and Young before we kick you off? <laughs> when do you open for your season? Uh, oh, that's a good question. We actually have a couple of volunteers opening on the weekends based on weather. Uh, okay. The park rangers the, the seasons won't be in until around memorial day so it's up to our volunteers to uh actually open and they usually do saturday sunday uh they just a few days during vacation week for the schools so uh if we've got veterans if they contact us through the facebook page uh, a lot of us that's why we do this you know we still have a few uh, 1950s era Maybe from Cass and Young, but from other ships, we try to get them, get them board. But uh, we're in there every Tuesday, every Saturday. If anybody close to Boston is interested in volunteering, uh, contact us and we'll uh, interview you. You are right. Uh, and you're interested, and you can go up and down the ladders. We'll make you a volunteer. Nice. <laughs> they won't have a choice. So, yeah, that's actually a very uh, important point. You know, we've talked about it before on Museum Ship Mafia. If anyone, anyone is interested in volunteering for any museum ships that, you know, might be nearby where they live, definitely check them out. But in the case of Cass and Young, if you are remotely close to the Boston area, check out the Friends of the Cass and Young Facebook group, uh, the uh, Friends of the Cass and Young F-O-T-C-Y Facebook group. They've got a ton of information there, plenty of pictures. And yeah, if you want to volunteer, I'm sure Buzz isn't going to turn you away. Quite the opposite. He's probably going to uh, make you stay. <laughs> and uh, Needle gun you know, right in your hand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, uh, of course, you can also learn more about the, the Casting Young, the Boston National Historic Park YouTube channel, uh, Boston NHP. I actually found a lot of interesting videos on there as well. So check out that YouTube channel. Uh, Buzz, anything else you want us to cover before we let you go? Uh, last thing, we uh, recorded a show for Fox Business uh, last spring, and they've been broadcasting it I, on demand now. Uh, all American built. Uh, it's hosted by Stuart Varney, and the ship, uh, yeah, the uh, show is called Destroyer, and it's all about the building of the ships during World War II. Uh, myself and Ranger Patrick were uh, spent a whole day recording, and honestly, it's about 30 minutes. Uh, the editor and producer did a great job on putting it together, and it's well worth the look. It, it goes into a little bit of weeds, and uh, Patrick and myself, I think we had a great day, and we learned a lot about how a major network does things. You know, so uh, you know, check that out when you find it on demand or on. I believe it may actually be on YouTube. If you look up American built. So, and that's American it for me. Built. And I, I appreciate it. Anytime you want me on. Well, no, I'm glad. Uh, so Shane's the one that kind of reached out to you. I'm glad you were able to join us tonight. Um, and, you know, again, one more time, you know, for those of you that are watching tonight, if you want to learn more, or for those of you that are watching the recording of this uh, episode of Museum Ship Mafia, please check out the Cass and Young on the Friends of the Cass and Young Facebook group. It's, it's pretty interesting stuff. So, Buzz, I'm going to say thanks for joining us. We're going to kick you off, and now we're going to talk behind your back. But, you know, of course, you'll thanks, have Buzz. the ability. You can stay on and, you know, listen. But, again, thanks for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. Yep. Thank you, Buzz. Yeah. Thank you. All right. He's off. <laughs> so, I got it. There, Hulk Hogan's tights. We're working on those hats. All right. So, uh, there's been a couple of comments by Hulk Hogan's tights. Uh, where are the hats? Where are those Sullivan hats? So I think we're working on those with the gift shop folks, uh, with the five gold stars, USS the Sullivan's DD 537 on one side. So I just got to squeeze that in real quick. So I think we're working on those. So but, when you come across somebody like Buzz at the Hinsa conference, yes. um, you know, I mean, not just Buzz, but um, it might have been, geez, before Parks was involved with the kid. What was the name of that? Is it, is it Trent at the kid? 
what was the name of the guy? Well, Roseanne was the prior executive director. No, there was Tim. Oh, Tim. Tim. That's who yeah. it was. Yeah. Okay. So Tim at the kid, Buzz at Cass and Young. Um, you know, when you guys all get together for you know at these conferences, and I know we've talked about the hints at conference before, but is is it all business or do you you know what else do you guys talk about besides museumship stuff? Honestly, guys, it's uh, John. Have you been in attendance? Have you gone? He has He's never I been. Haven't. to one. That's right, because you were be my first. Yeah. Yes, and you're hosting. Listen, man, it's all business. Yeah, right. right? And I, I, it is. That's why I'm there. You know, I go to make connections to meet people. You know, I met Buzz, and this is how we started this 80th anniversary thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Tim was not there this year from the kid, but I, I, you, you know, uh, Fred Clink that we had on a few. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, Fred from the uh, the Fred, you know, you, you, it is a large thing. Like there's a hundred and hundred people there, 120 people there, but you find these little pockets of people, right? Okay. Either at a table or you're like, you know, can I join you for lunch? Or, and then they usually say, get out of here, Shane. Or can I join you for dinner? And they say, ditto, you're gone. Right. But you, you kind of find these pockets of people of course, you're like, so what do you do with your life, right? So what's going on, you know? But but mostly it's about, well, tell me about your ship. We'll tell you about ours, uh, you know, resources, sharing of resources, things like that. So it's, these conferences are just valuable to uh, to make those connections. And this is, you know, everyone says, oh, I'll call you, you know, we'll talk. We'll talk after the conference. Well, I try to be that person that says, no, I actually will reach out to you. Yeah. And so that's why uh, it's, you know, and so that's something I'm proud of as myself to say, I will say that I'll talk to you after the conference, but then I actually make the attempt to do so. And when it comes to this fall's conference, uh, you know, which is obviously going to be in Albany, are you guys, and John, are you guys just getting started? Are you in the middle of it? How's that looking? In terms of the planning of the conference? Yeah. So Hensa is the one who actually will plan um, what programs will be going on. Um, we're just we're just hosting. So okay, you know, so we you, do you have no involvement with that whatsoever. Then um, I don't want to say. Uh, so I'm not part of it. The conversation uh, that is Shanna. Uh, she's coordinating all that. Um, mm -hmm. It's in, it's fallen onto her lap. Uh, I I'm sure the Slater will do some sort of presentation, but we haven't really. Mm -hmm. I, I think uh, if there's going to be a presentation from the Slater, um, it's probably going to be a, some sort of volunteer thing, uh, how to recruit like a volunteer force, I would imagine. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I was thinking my first, my first uh, HINSA conference was in Manitowoc, right? With the USS Cobia and the yeah. Wisconsin Maritime Museum. That will be, I think is kind of how this will go. I mean, when you have access to a battleship in the Alabama and the Missouri, you could do a lot on board the ships. And there was a lot for this conference, the, the past two conferences that you could actually host events, uh, discussions and talks on the battleship yeah. for the Wisconsin conference. Uh, we like, we had to go off site for a couple of things, uh, and things like that. So, um, yeah, obviously we're too small to really be doing like a large scale event at the ship. So yeah. it'd be, it's probably going to be a lot of the hotel um, events. Uh, but, you know, we're right in downtown. We're, you know, minutes. And then we're heading to Lark downtown. Street. We're going to we're gonna head out to Lark Street, guys. <laughs> Are you right? the one who said you had like an ex-girlfriend that lived on Lark Street or something? I do have an ex-girlfriend that yeah. lives, well, in Albany. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, that was a long time ago. That was like college girlfriend, you know, so. <laughs> But no, it, Ken, you're coming, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm really Great. looking forward to it. Um, and great. actually, uh, you know, I sent you that email asking for Ryan's email address. I wanted to contact him about the possibility of actually presenting something at oh, the yeah. conference. So uh, hopefully I can actually make something like that work. Um, all right. So we're going to wrap this up because now it is, <laughs> this might be one of our longer episodes because now it's about 940 your guys' time. Um, no, no, no. Last one was we went right to ten bells last time. What with uh with Connor? Did we? 
Yeah, it was right at 10 o'clock, I think. It, we went to about two hours. So this is good. Yeah, an hour. And, and that was great having Buzz on. I'm sorry for, to have, you know, and I know you'll say that too about it, the connection. I don't know if he was in his basement or something like that. But yeah, the, uh, the, the connection was rough. That was kind of a bummer. Um, but I will say that, you know, I did kind of learn a lot. Uh, I, it looks like they've got a pretty strong volunteer program, which was pretty cool. Um, you know, and I'll, I'm just going to, I'm going to bring this picture up. I love seeing stuff like, um, oh, well here, uh, this, this one right here, you know, so when you talk about the volunteers doing work like this, um, and let me. Where the heck was that? Uh, bear with me. He sent me a ton of pictures. Oh, yeah, here we go. Yeah. So when you talk about volunteers doing stuff like this, when I see pictures, it's just like I, I I always find that stuff pretty exciting, pretty inspiring. I know that, you know, the Slater's volunteer program is rock solid and you guys are building it at the Buffalo Naval Park. So, you know, I was uh, I was kind of happy to hear him talk about this guy, Bill, who <laughs> just loves to paint, paint everything. Yeah. And, so yeah, that, those are pretty cool stories. And I think anyone that is at all interested, and that was actually Connor's uh, story from last month, right? Remember he showed up yeah. at the Alexander Henry mm -hmm. just for a tour. And now all of a sudden he's, you know, super involved with the Alexander Henry, as, you know, as a volunteer, he's super involved with the Museum Ships Facebook group. And and th those are pretty cool stories. I was actually uh, really yeah. happy to meet him this past that's, Sunday. Yeah, that's fabulous. Mm -hmm. I, I because of my things. Uh, so he met you in Minnesota, or were you elsewhere? Yeah, he was. Um, hold on a second here. He was. Okay, I can. Uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, so he was here this this past Sunday to check out the Pearl Harbor gun here in Minneapolis, and. Yeah, so he he cool. drove all the way down from Thunder Bay, Ontario. Wow, uh, with his dad and his brother, it was really cool to meet them as well. So yeah, it was a real thrill. And if Shane, if you didn't see it, he also gave me a hold on a second here. He gave me a mug. <laughs> yeah, that ugly mug. Get it off the screen. What that ugly mug? No, it's not ugly. <laughs> it's great. That was the joke. No, that was the joke you said earlier. You're like, oh, you guys don't get it. Ugly mug. Get it? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you see it? And and of course. Oh my god, here we go again. Get that ugly yeah. mug off the screen. Now that uh -huh. now get that ugly mug off the screen too. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so it was it was great. It was great meeting uh Connor. And you know, when I when I meet somebody like this, obviously he's quite a bit younger than I am. And you know, you get uh oh great. There's You're only lot. 25 though, right? Ken? How old is that? <laughs> Connor, how old are you? I really don't know how old you are. I was going to guess more towards 30, but um, yeah, 28 or something, maybe. But when you think about, you know, somebody like Connor and the energy, oh, he's 28. Okay, there you go. And of course, I'm a few years older than that. When you think about the energy that he brings to the museum ship community, it, 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 it's, it's kind of, he turned 28 on Sunday. It, it's kind of the future. Well, John, and you're what are you? You're 31. How old are you? I'm 28 as well. Oh, you're 28. I thought you. I thought you already crossed 30. Sorry, man. I didn't mean to prematurely age you. But actually, you, I turn my birthday. You did the is same thing weeks. to me. Though. Oh, very good. Happy birthday. We won't see you before then. So you. yeah, he yeah. did the same thing to me. He prematurely aged me. But the 28, <laughs> you guys have a goatees. Right, that must be a thing for twenty-eight-year-olds no, these just, days. Huh, just called laziness on my end. <laughs> is that what it is? No. Uh, no, but what I was saying is like you know, no, it's, it's good. Pretty, it's pretty amazing, you know, to see somebody like Connor get you know dive dive so deeply into the oh, Alexander yeah. Henry. Well, and John, you know, you're you're an example too. If you're twenty-eight years old, you know, that's a total generation away from Shane and I. And you know, you're like way way involved with. Well, it's your job you know, with the Slater. So that's, that's pretty impressive too. You guys are the future. That's the way I look at it. Um, so anyway, I get a kick out of this. And the whole point of me mentioning this is that if you've got anything like the Slater, like the Buffalo Naval Park, like the Cass and Young, I, you know, the list goes on near your house, the Alexander Henry near where you live, you got to just 
not only take a tour, but say, hey, by the way, tell me about your volunteer program and they will suck you up and find out, you know, do you like to paint? Do you like to weld? Do you like to whatever you like to do? They could use the help. Maybe you're a bookkeeper, yeah. you know, and you want, you know, they need help with the books, whatever. It could be as simple as just coming in once a week or once a month and just sweeping. Like, yeah. yeah. Literally that frees up hands to do other work. So. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that's the kind of stuff that they that they like to see. So, uh, yeah, I was thrilled to have Buzz on there. Fantastic to learn about the Cass and Young. Uh, John Epp, curator at the USS Slater. What do you uh, what do you want to close with? Uh, let's see. Uh, if anyone wants to come visit us, we're opening for our 26th season, April 5th. So our next episode, we will be open. Uh, oh, okay. okay. Yeah, right? When, it's like when, When's our next one? It's usually the Wednesday, right? The second yeah, Wednesday. Of the month. Oh, second Wednesday of the month. Yeah. So our our next museum ship episode, museum ship mafia episode, will be the twelfth. That's correct. Yeah, so we'll be open for a season. Uh, anything new for the tour season? Um, I don't think so. Uh, so last season we ad- we did uh, started doing add on tours. Um, well, that is, we started pushing them more. In the past, we didn't really advertise them a whole lot. We're hoping to increase it even more. Uh, we made, oh, geez, a, f- a few extra thousand dollars last year just because of add-on tours. So we're hoping to increase that this year. Um, and like Ken said, we're always looking for volunteers. Uh, tour guides, we love getting new tour guides. Um, it's 100% exclusive uh, tour uh, via tour guide on the ship. And <laughs> they are fanatics when it comes to our ship so uh you will learn more than you even want to learn so if you're interested in doing that that's something of course maintenance as well (laughs) um i saw that there was a question now hold us yeah it must mean uh, michael must mean that it's on our youtube channel or something yeah i I just saw the buffalo naval park youtube channel oh here we go here we go um Lego History Sam says, "Hey History X, I am going to Minnesota in the summer, and I'm hope, I'm hope, hopping, hoping. Okay, he must. He, okay, he must mean I'm hoping to check out the Pearl Harbor gun. Yeah, I will. Yeah, tell, well, I will tell you that you know, just like what Connor did, you know, he let me know that he was coming to check out the Pearl Harbor gun." Anyone that wants to check out the Pearl Harbor gun with with me, um, I, I will be more than happy. I will be more than happy to show it to you because it is it is an amazing piece of history. I can't believe it's actually here in the Twin Cities. Of course, there's a story why it's here in the Twin Cities, but for those of you that don't know, this is the gun that fired the first shots of Pearl Harbor. And it wasn't the Japanese. It was actually the Americans. I'm pretty proud of that fact that it was the Americans that fired the first shots of Pearl Harbor. And that gun is here in Minnesota. So anyone, uh, Lego History Sam, like Connor, whatever, anyone that wants to come and see this gun, and I, I will meet you there and show it to you. It's it's fantastic. So matter of fact, this summer, uh, this spring or this summer, you see those rust spots on the barrel. I'm actually going to head over there and try and oh, take nice. care of those, get those to go away. You're going to ask for permission first, right? What's that? You're going to ask for permission first. No, just do it. I think I, I, I there might not be a governing entity anymore there. You know, they, the entity that brought it there might not be, it might be disbanded or something. So it will be up to volunteers like you can. Well, there's okay. It is sitting on the grounds of the Minnesota state Capitol. So yeah. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> yeah so there might be um uh there, there might yeah i don't know i don't know exactly who i should talk to my plan was to actually just show up there with a step ladder and some sandpaper and start getting to work and then you know john john i saw you what are you saying that's a bad idea no get permission first it's get permission from who it is a historic artifact it's if it's on the state grounds it's most likely owned by the state so um, yeah, go, go into the uh, go into the, the the building that it's on. Well, I know what you're saying, though. Like I know what you're saying. Like set up your camera, 
you know, if it will make good things that the, the security comes out and says, stop what you're doing. What are you doing? And I'm like, I'm just, you know, I mean, I get that it looks, it's good theater, but uh, you, what you should find out is who actually owns the gun or who was it, what entity was it loaned to? Mm -hmm. And once you find those records, then you know potentially who to go back to. So, I mean, yeah, there's got to be the county clerk or something or the clerk's office or the state clerk. <sighs> That you can find that information from so yeah you know what i might i might actually talk to you about this offline because it sounds like you might have a pretty good idea as, as to how to approach this uh yeah, if we go this way would you want if this was a museum ship you just want some random bimbo coming off the street with a step ladder <laughs> and some paint and start sanding the outside of the ship oh, <laughs> i love it <laughs> well um no i would not however right. Um, I mean, to have, to have, you know, to have a step, what, so to have someone show up in a convertible with a step ladder sticking out of the, uh, the shop <laughs> and, and, a, and a can of paint and some sandpaper, you don't think that's official? We also <laughs> have to have the correct type of paints, which the correct. Yeah, you got to make sure it's the, you yeah. got to make sure you get a, you get a chip you know, get a chip from it and then take it to a paint thing. It could be, it could be ocean gray, it could be haze gray, you mm -hmm. know? So, I mean, USS Ward, uh, find out what the USS Ward was painted, you know, in her original configuration. That was a 1930s destroyer. I don't know the class offhand. I'm getting uh, a headache. Um, but you know what I'm saying? Like find out the camouflage schemes of the USS Ward. That's right. where it Came from. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. I was right, well. That's not. We don't need to get into this here. No, we can no, talk no, 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 no. I wasn't. But you brought it up, so I wasn't going to actually bring this up. But here's what I was going to do, and you tell me. Oh yeah, Ken, that's a great idea. Or you tell me. Yeah, Ken, you're going about this all wrong. Okay. okay? Here's what I was going to do. You I was going to go to Home Home Depot, get a whole bunch of paint chips, find a color that matches, and uh, like I said, show up there with my step ladder and my sandpaper and my cameras and like take a picture of, you know, watch, watch me do this, prime it, then paint it. And um, it sounds now is is that the good way to do it or hold on a second, somebody. No, what I would do, what I would have done <laughs> is I would have gone and yet yeah, yeah, thank you, CC. That's right. Uh, I would have gotten a chip off of the gun. Oh, great. Oh, so and you would have take it. vandalized the gun. No, and... you're not vandalizing. You can take a little one inch by one inch somewhere. You see it right on the barrel there. Uh -huh. And then you take that to Home Depot and have them match a paint to that chip. I mean, if you can find 25 different grays and then you're bringing the swatches there, that could, you know, so you're not doing, not that you would do damage to it. But yeah, I mean, if you could just get a little half an inch by half an inch or one inch by one inch or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you, so you're doing it in reverse. You're taking that to Home Depot and then you're having them mix it and blend it. But I also would do research into uh, the USS Ward and what type of scheme she was wearing. There's a lot of information out there about camouflage schemes. And then they also have colorways and swatches right online about that sort of stuff too. So well, and Eric makes a good point. As they're cuffing me and taking me away. You know, well, it makes for good theater, yeah, sir. Right. Good theater. Uh huh. Yeah. And yeah, Eric's right. It's like, hey, look, at George, look at George. Look at George's comment. <laughs> look at look at George's comment. Love it. Uh, I saw that. Yeah. George. Where, uh, so I'm, I'm actually in Minneapolis. Um, where where in the metro are you? Uh, are you more St. Paul? Uh, are you like maybe more like uh, Burnsville, Plymouth, whereabouts in the Twin Cities are you? Let me know. And hell yeah, let's... Uh, That's cool, uh, guys. I don't like seeing rust spots on the barrel of a gun like this. And, uh, and a lot of people on the Museum Ships Facebook group actually said, it's like, if this is the gun that fired the first shots of Pearl Harbor, what is it doing outside? It should be inside. And I actually, I agree mm. with that. Yeah. Um, somebody... Right, a, what? Are we... Okay. Yeah, go no, ahead. We're Sorry. Not, what Shane wants to go, but someone else actually made a comment here um, about, oh, here we go. Hulk, Hulk Hogan's tights. The first shot <laughs> fired at Pearl Harbor were actually by PT boats. Interesting. I, I don't, I haven't heard, I don't know that history then. Neither do I, but I wonder if he's right. It could be. They're firing at midget subs. So 
77 foot Elko PT boats. Yeah, that would take a little more interesting. That would take a little more digging. I'm going to look that up because if yeah. he's right, um, that's pretty cool. You got to take down that video you made. No, I wouldn't take it down. I would just create a whole new video. <laughs> um, so, all right. So getting back. Okay. So we talked to John about uh, what's, you know, the Slater, um, you know, preparing for opening. Bear with me a moment. The best way to check out the Slater and their information, obviously their YouTube channel search for the USS Slater, same thing on Facebook. Uh, they just posted a picture of Shanna and I'm sorry, who was the other person in you know picture of their office in the wardroom? Joanne, she's our business manager. So she handles gotcha. every single donation that comes into the ship. Yeah. So definitely check out their Facebook page. Uh, you can check out their website, ussslater.org. And, you know, like I always say, click like, subscribe, you know, on their YouTube channel and throw your support behind the USS Slater. Shane Stevenson, curator and director of collections at the Buffalo and Erie County Naval and Military Park. What's, uh, you know, what do you want to let us know before uh, we shut things down tonight? Well, again, like just kind of summaries for the people that maybe weren't there in the beginning. We're having a St. Patrick's Day party on March 16th, next Thursday. You can buy tickets. You also get uh, some beer, I guess, if that's what it is, beer and uh, corned beef and cabbage. Uh, we open March 25th uh, and April 4th. We are releasing, uh, you know, this kind of year of the Sullivans for the 80th but also reflecting back because it was close to the capsizing event on April 14th. So it's going to be about the launching, what we're doing for the rest of the season for the Sullivans and uh, going uh, and going on from there, the add on tours. I know John was just mentioning about his add on tours. So we're doing a lot of that and then the curator tours and, you know, just all this other stuff this year. So and working with the 80th for the kid and the cast and young. So that's what I've got. I wanted to give a shout out real quick to um, this guy right here. Um, so Rob with uh, Rocky Mountain Life Prospecting at the YouTube channel. If you guys have an interest in, you know, gold prospect prospecting or metal detecting, he, this guy lives in Colorado in the mountains of Colorado, and he he's he actually contacted me, or no, actually I he, he may have commented on some of my videos. I contacted him. Uh, actually interviewed him a couple of months, uh, several months ago. I want to post that video, but this guy has the life. He runs around the mountains of Colorado with his metal detector, looking for all kinds of stuff. And Great. yeah, I know. And, and, uh, and when you see this guy, his video, he's got this like Indiana Jones hat. I mean, he is the real deal. So check out his YouTube channel. If you're looking for some different content to watch, um, Rob is amazing. So, and he also has a uh, veteran support uh, aspect to what he does as well. So pretty cool stuff. And uh, let's see, with that being said, um, like I said, Shane Stevenson, curator at the Buffalo Naval Park, check out the YouTube channel, Buffalo Naval Park's YouTube channel. Simply in the search bar, type in Buffalo Naval Park and you will get all their videos. If you want to join their members only section, I'm a member. John's a member, five bucks a month, and you get uh, special behind the scenes access to, um, well, special content that you guys are posting that you you can't just get on on the regular. And it's it's more kind of behind the scenes stuff that, you know, if you want to say that their YouTube channel is more on the official side, you get into their members only section and you get additional access behind the scenes, how, what it's like to actually work there. So I think that's that's a lot of fun. Check that out. That's five bucks a month. Anything else you wanted to add about the members only? No, I think we we have filmed our one of our March. We do get two videos to become a member and then uh, one live session. So we got to get with uh, Ken here and talk about the StreamYard thing because uh, we had a problem last month as well. But um, yeah, we'll get that figured out. Don't worry about that. That's no big deal. Thank you, Ken. Yeah, no, no, yeah, absolutely. So, and and you guys are going to be announcing when the next uh, live is going to come up for that. Yeah, we will be doing that probably next week, probably. Okay, all right. Thanks, gotcha. man. And uh, you know, like I always like to say, uh, you know, this is uh, this episode of Museum Ship Mafia made possible by Auto Audible. Listen to the good stuff. Download an audio book for your drive or to help you go to sleep. 
that's going to be in the description of this video below. So definitely check on that and uh, click on that link. Um, they've got stuff like Last Stands of the Tin Can Sailors, Black Sheep Squadron by Pappy Boyington. So all kinds of good stuff to check out there. Um, my name is Ken Stano with the YouTube channel History X. As always, I like to apologize to Ryan Samansky for not being able to get him on tonight. One of these days, we'll get him on. I've got his email address now, so I'll start hunting him down. And for audio versions of this podcast, search for Museum Ship Mafia on your favorite podcast platform. Anything I, I may have forgot, guys? Nope. No, I think we're good, sir. Fantastic. So for the Buffalo Naval Park and USS Slater, as I said a few moments ago, my name is Ken Stano with the YouTube channel History X. Thank you for watching. Night, everyone.